So first I wanted to explain a bit about what BioLogos is. Uh, so BioLogos was founded by Francis Collins. Uh, he is one of the world's leading scientists. He directed the Human Genome Project, and he now directs the National Institutes of Health. And he wrote a book called The Language of God, in which he gave his own story of becoming a Christian as an adult um, through reading C.S. Lewis. And when this book came out, it became uh, this bestseller because so many people had not been able to picture a top scientist who was also a committed Christian at the same time. And so he got tons of questions, and uh, he founded BioLogos to be a website to answer those questions. We now have hundreds and I think over a thousand uh, resources on our site, articles, uh, blog entries, videos. So I encourage you to look at it. If you want to learn more about our organization, there is a brochure on the table back there. And so it's a privilege for me now to be leading this organization. Uh, BioLogos is inviting the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith. And that's what this whole lecture series is about. So I'm giving three talks today. This first one is going to start out broad, um, thinking about the intersection of science in general with ministry. Um, and then at 2 o'clock, it's going to be uh, the intersection of biology, evolutionary biology, with Christian faith. And in the uh, last talk, it'll be uh, the intersections between astronomy and Christian faith. And as Helen said, I'm an astronomer myself, so I get to go out on, on my favorite topic. Um, so one thing I want to talk about in this hour is the impact these issues are making on the church and the uh, benefits to ministry that can be had by engaging science in effective ways. Uh, it's not just an interesting side topic, it can actually help the church in many core areas of its ministry. So uh, th to give uh, credit here, a lot of this was developed when I uh, led the Ministry Theorem Project. This was a project at Calvin Seminary um, and led by uh, Reverend Scott Jose, who's the director of the Center for Excellence in Preaching there. And uh, we worked together. We had a grant from the John Templeton Foundation. And that is another website that is full of resources. And through that program, I met uh, with a lot of different uh, pastors and ministry leaders, heard a lot of their stories of things they tried, how things worked. And uh, I summarized that all in this uh, article, which has become your handout today. That's something I wrote for the uh, Fuller Theological Seminary newsletter. And a lot of what I'm saying today is in that handout. So, And also, if you go on to the online version of that handout, there's dozens of links embedded in the article where you can link to different articles and resources and curricula. So uh, check out the online version as well. So what does it mean for the church to engage science? Well, it probably doesn't mean this. You invite the pastor in and the scientist is saying, this one, we want you to pray for this one. <laughs> and as a, as a scientist, oh my, it's, it feels like that sometimes. You're doing your experiment, we're working with data, and it's like, please, can this just work out? But of course, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what does it mean to, uh, for the church to engage science in effective ways? So I want to talk first about the challenges and then um, about there being more than one Christian view on origins and then about being more than origins and about it being more than just issues. So the challenges, well you can easily imagine these and some of you have already mentioned them to me. It's not easy to incorporate science into ministry. Why ask for controversy? Why stir up a hornet's nest? Um, Sunday morning isn't the time for a science lesson. What does science have to do with our primary ministries? We're too busy to do science in addition to everything else. This stuff is too intellectual for my congregation. And what if I get the science wrong? And I've talked to pastors who've had a heartfelt fear of that, a desire to engage science, but worried that they will make, say wrong scientific things from the pulpit. So it's not easy, but there are risks too of not doing it. So uh, one of the, the themes in all of my talks today is the glory of God that um, uh, we, people need to have a chance to praise God for the things that science is discovering. Also, our culture is saturated with science. Um, all of the technology in this room that's allowing us to sit here, from the heating to the, uh, the projector, um, all of the healthcare that we enjoy today, our lives are permeated by technology and its impact. And if the church is not engaging that, we're missing out on an important aspect of our lives. Uh, problems of young people, which I'll say more about in a minute. Uh, elderly will wonder why these issues were never addressed. This is a comment I've gotten uh, quite often when I've spoken to groups of retirees. People will come up to me and say, how come nobody ever told us this? There are people who are hungry for it, and if, you, um, if a church ignores it, they're missing out on the people who would really like to hear. 
And in the absence of saying anything, um, members of congregations and non-Christians tend to just pick up this idea that science conflicts with Christianity because it's so prevalent in our culture. They pick it up from Christian radio or from a secular news media or from I, I don't know where. Um, so uh, uh, ministry leaders might be thinking, oh, our congregation doesn't think that, but you'd be surprised. Like a lot of them are uh, picking up these ideas. So here is a summary of a Gallup survey over the last uh, few decades from 1982 to 1912. So this was a, a survey where people were asked to agree to one of these three statements. Um, God created humans pretty much in their present form in the last 10,000 years, so that would be the young earth position. Human beings developed over millions of years uh, from less advanced forms of life, but God guided the process. So some idea that God was part of the picture, but a long time frame. And then human beings developed over millions of years, but God had no part in the process. And so you can see the first answer, the young earth answer has been hovering around 45% of US adults for the last 30 years. The answer of evolution with God doing something has been hovering around 35% that whole time. And the uh, atheist answer has been going up from 10 to 15% or so. So that says that there's a lot of uh, uh, difference of opinion among the US public in general. I could say a whole bunch more in statistics, but I want to get to a lot of other stuff. So uh, uh, I, I do want to tell you, though, about two surveys of two particular audiences. So there's a survey of clergy that uh, BioLogos sponsored uh, in 2012, led by the Barna Group. And uh, we asked clergy of all denominations. It was a representative group. Um, we asked, what were their concerns about evolution? That was one of the questions. 26% of the clergy said, oh, there's no idea, no concern with the idea that God used evolution to create. Um, however, there were, and, and this broke down by uh, denominational lines, so there was, uh, the mainline Protestants would be most likely to be in this category. The evangelical Protestants or the Pentecostals would um, be much more in the young earth category in expressing these kinds of theological concerns 60% of clergy overall are concerned about scripture, about the historical Adam, death and sin, and the same kinds of questions that are probably in your minds and in the minds of everybody I talk to. In addition, for clergy, there's career risks, and some of you may be very familiar with this. We asked the question to find out how prevalent this was, and yes, um, like 60% of young earth creationists say that they would have um, you know, a lot to lose in their ministry if they even expressed doubts. And that does not provide an environment where you can have a lot of conversation. So uh, this is Pastor Dean Smith of the Highway Community Church out in California, and he's one of the pastors uh, we've been uh, talking to at BioLogos. And he um, tells the story of how before he encountered BioLogos, he was just unsure how to preach on Genesis. I don't, I'm not sure for him his career was at risk, but he didn't know what, what was God's word to his people in Genesis in light of all the science. It was just a big issue. And uh, after discovering the resources on our site and, and hearing some talks from BioLogo speakers, he felt a lot more comfortable. And I, I think that's very important that a pastor shouldn't feel like they can't preach on a certain passage because of these concerns. So that's uh, an important part of what we're doing at BioLogos is uh, talking with pastors. And a huge concern for us at BioLogos and for many of us is young people. Uh, your children, I've heard from people talking to me about uh, just in the last two days about their teenage children. Um, your grandchildren, and um, what is this, how is this issue impacting their lives? Of course, they're learning science in school, and they can look up anything on Wikipedia. So, you know, if the pastor's up front saying something, they can be sitting there on their phone and saying, oh, no, Wikipedia says different. So it's, it's, it's a new world we live in. Some surveys have been done on what impact it's having, and this is a survey by Elaine Eklund, and she's done some great research on this. She interviewed a lot of top research scientists, and for the subset of those who grew up in the faith and are now atheists, she asked them, what made you leave? And one of the common ancestor answers was that the church didn't listen to my questions. And you can picture, these are the top research scientists. Imagine them as teenagers. They were the geeky kid in the back who's like, what about this, what about that? Hey, teacher, what about this? And the poor Sunday school teacher was like, okay, come on, just believe, here's what the Bible says, don't ask so many questions. And, and they thought the church was not willing to listen to their questions. So 
Um, so it's a big issue. Similar results from this survey that was specifically about young people who left the faith, um, about nine, uh, boy, 1,300 of them. They uh, found young people who had grown up in the faith, attended church through age 15, and then left, asked them why, and these are the kinds of answers they said. Um, they were not able to ask my most pressing life questions in church. Churches are out of step with the scientific world we live in. Christianity is anti-science. Been turned off by the debate, just the acrimony of the debate. So these things are important for ministry because young people are leaving the church because of it. So what can we do to make a difference? Um, it's not just statistics. This is a young man named, named David Buller who grew up um, in a homeschool environment and went to John Brown University, which is one of the most uh, conservative um, uh, universities, evangelical universities, and he really struggled over this. And he was a bright young man and he did a lot of reading on his own and eventually came to see how he could accept the, the findings of science and biblical faith together. But there was a friend of his who went through the same educational experience and ended up walking away from the church. So what can the church do in response? Well, I think the most, one of the most effective things we can do is convey to people that there's more than one Christian position. And so first of all, it is a fact. There are um, a wide range of views among committed Christians on these scientific questions. And it's not a salvation issue. It's not in the Apostles' Creed. Um, it's not in the Four Spiritual Laws, if you're in that kind of environment. It's, um, it's not something people should not have, should not feel forced to choose between hanging on to the faith that they have grown up in and love and respect and the compelling evidence in God's creation. So we wanna find ways for people to not feel it's a salvation issue. So talking about multiple views is helpful for that. So here's a few little you know, conversation starters with uh, students who come with questions. You can ask them, what are you learning about science in school? How do you see it fitting uh, with your faith? What, what concerns you about that? Um, you can say, I don't know. You know, I believe God created the world, but I'm not sure how or when. That's amazingly powerful. It was powerful in my own life. I grew up in a home that was, you know, by default, the earth was young because that seemed the right idea. And my dad, in fact, took me to some young earth creationist conferences, which I thought were pretty cool as a kid. Then in high school, I uh, took high school biology and read some of the evidence for evolution and went, oh, there's something here. What in the world do we do with this? So I brought it home and showed it to my dad. And he's like, really? Okay. And so we talked and talked. And uh, finally, he said, you know, I don't know either. And that just freed me up. It's like, okay. My, the world doesn't fall just because we haven't figured this out. My faith isn't at risk. I can be a Christian and not know. And I promptly put off dealing with the whole issue for like 10 years because <laughs> I just didn't want to think about it. But, but it, it, it meant that my faith wasn't in jeopardy. Another thing you can say is, you know, I don't accept evolution myself, but I've heard that some Christians do, and so don't let that get in the way of following Jesus. That kind of uh, messaging is helpful. So in a curricular sense, what are some practical things? I want to be practical on this talk as well. So uh, what, one pitfall is to try to explain it all in one sermon. Um, it's way, <laughs> yeah, okay, you know what I mean. It's just do way too much to cover and it's not preaching, okay? So it's better to deal with it in the uh, Sunday school environment. Um, at the other extreme is teaching about Genesis in kindergarten and they're coloring what's made on each day and then say nothing about it after that and then you know these children are growing up and then they go off to college and all they have is that kindergarten picture of Genesis 1. It's still a great story it works at the um, at the younger ages beautifully I would not I, I would certainly use it it's, it's concrete it's glorious it, it teaches the fundamental truths that God made the world and the world is good. Um, at the elementary level I think students can start understanding about ancient Near East cosmology, the ancient Near East pantheon of gods, because that's in all those Old Testament stories, all the gods of the nations surrounding the Israelites. And if you put that in contrast with Genesis 1, so students can see, oh, Genesis 1 is, doesn't have any of those foreign gods in it, it has the one god Yahweh, um, that can be uh, helpful. By middle school you can start to distinguish like the who, why questions from the how, when questions. Um, discuss what the purpose of the Bible is for. High school and adult, then talking about the different Christian points of view and their pros and cons is good. Um, I would avoid sort of, uh, the curricular idea of telling each student, okay, so uh, write a little paper or give a defense of what you think the right view is. Um, that, I don't think 
hardly anyone's ready for that when they first encounter this topic. I think much better to uh, educate and quiz them on, so what is the young earth position? What is an evolutionary creation position? What's in, what is intelligent design about? And just have people clear on what the arguments are for each of those. And then they can keep considering that on their own time. Some churches have done beautiful intergenerational things. Uh, one church that uh, invited me out uh, had a six-week sermon series that addressed these questions over six weeks, and they had all of the youth curriculum and adult Sunday school all in line with the same topic. So the whole family was learning about it at an age-appropriate level, and then could be talking about it at home. Another church had uh, the adult Sunday school do it for three or four weeks, so the adults got up to speed, and then the youth Sunday school did it after that, and then the adults could be helping their young people as they're thinking it through. And I think for everyone uh, uh, celebrating the joy of scientific discovery and not just um, that this is all controversial is important. If you're looking for actual curricula, um, I have to recommend the stuff from my publisher, Faith Alive Christian Resources did our book, but they also did a high school uh, version and a middle school version, and I believe there's links to those in that online version of the handout. Another important thing about this more than one Christian view is, is it possible to have a gracious conversation um, it seems harder and harder. As in so many controversial areas in our culture, things are getting more and more polarized, and space for uh, civil dialogue is, seems to be shrinking. I do hear many voices calling for more civil dialogue, and you probably feel that way too. Um, but the loudest voices in our culture um, aren't that way. Now, so these are some of the organizations that are trying to have conversation about this and talk about it. So Answers in Genesis would be the young earth creation position that God created everything 10,000 years ago and a literal reading of Genesis 1 as an essential part to understanding all of scripture. Uh, Reasons to Believe uh, is also committed to, and they would call themselves inerrant, and, but they believe in an old universe with each day in Genesis being stretched out to a long period of time but they would disagree with the evidence for evolution. The Discovery Institute promotes intelligent design, which uh, cross cuts a, a, across some of these. Um, intelligent design is not necessarily a Christian view. There's Jews and agnostics that are part of the intelligent design movement, or, uh, but it is uh, also looking for uh, pieces in the evolutionary story that science isn't explaining and having those as pointers to a uh, designer of some sort. And then um, at Biologos, we're promoting the, what we call the evolutionary creation position, which has God using the process, uh, that the universe is old, and God using the process of evolution to create. That's a lot of different viewpoints there. I'm going to say a lot more about all those issues later on. What I want to talk about, though, is this issue of gracious dialogue. So uh, maybe you heard about this debate. This was back in February. Uh, we have Bill Nye, the science guy, versus Ken Ham uh, of Answers in Genesis. So you have one of the, the uh, most well-known proponents of young earth creation versus one of the most well-known popularizers of science. And unfortunately, you know, it really perpetuated this idea that there are two positions and they're at war with each other. The debate itself was not as uh, acrimonious as it could have been. There was a, a, they actually kept the tone reasonably good, but they did talk past each other. It was not real engagement in any way. And we want something better um, at Biologos, and we have been partnering um, with the Reasons to Believe. So this is Hugh Ross, president of Reasons to Believe, and a week after that debate, Hugh and I were together out in California, and we presented um, together, but we did everything we could to make it not a debate, and uh, we didn't allow it, uh, ourselves to use PowerPoint even, because we didn't want to lecture. We sat down in armchairs, and we talked to each other and asked each other questions. And it, I, I hope people could, could see that we really do feel a strong sense of shared faith. To both of us, it's very important to, be, to display Christian love and Christian unity that is more fundamental than any of these disagreements. But we still um, talked honestly about where we disagree. We disagree about evolution and we disagree about biblical interpretation. But we agree on the importance of evangelism and um, so many things about the core of our faith. If you want to know more about Dialogues, I recommend the Colossian Forum. It's a fairly new organization, but they are doing a lot to help communities come together and have conversations about difficult topics in a fully Christian way with uh, worship as part of the experience. Okay, time to move on from origins. 
There are so many science topics other than origins that the church should be thinking about. Here's just a whole bunch of words there on the screen about different ones. Um, I, I hope that young people today are digging into some of these issues. Many of these are things on the, the front page of the, uh, they're things that our culture is asking questions about. They're things that affect how we live our lives. This origins question doesn't affect too much about how you live. I mean, it affects the faith lives of some people if they're told it's an essential faith question, but I mean, this affects how you um, use energy and how you uh, care for others. Now, uh, science is an important part of addressing all of these questions, but science can't do it alone. It needs to partner with people who care, who want to make a difference, and the church, which has the whole um, theological and framework and the um, ethical implementation of things, to make good use of science in addressing these questions. Now, they're all political. So here he is at the bookstore, political science, politicized science. <laughs> oh, yes. And again, it's, so it's uh, tempting to just ignore it because it's too political. We don't need that kind of hassle in our lives. Um, but I, I think it's also uh, bad if, if the church ignores it because it's too political. So here's some ways that the science can help the church fulfill its mission and calling, some of its core ministries. Um, respecting all life, bioethics, the Christian Medical and Dental Association, uh, full of uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, medical professionals, and they have quite uh, an arm that does bioethics work, and many others do as well. Uh, caring for the sick is also a huge part of what they do. My own denomination, the Christian Reformed Church, had this Embrace AIDS initiative. Um, and then empowering the poor, Engineering Ministries International, you probably never heard of it or even thought of it, but if you think of uh, the, the developing world, the majority world, uh, you bring in the technology we use here in North America and it breaks and they have no way to fix it. And these engineers are designing devices that can be maintained, repaired, and be very useful in developing uh, countries. So, uh, you know, uh, ovens, that solar-powered ovens might be an example, things like that. So these are ways to empower the poor, help them in improving um, their economic well-being, and that's part of what we are called to do as the church. Uh, science is also important for the church's ministry of creation care. We're called to be stewards of the earth. And this is, of course, very pressing. If you've read any of the ne recent news stories on climate change, you'll know that the situation has uh, been confirmed over and over by the scientific evidence that the climate is changing, <clears throat> and it is changing in response to human activity. And uh, we need to do what we can to address it and uh, try to mitigate it at this point. I, I recommend highly the Evangelical Environmental Network, also called creationcare.org. Okay, so you're most, maybe mostly Presbyterians, but in my circles, this is the one I, I recommend. Um, because they are helping evangelicals work through this issue and find ways that they can care for the creation. I wanted to tell you this example of creation care that's from uh, literally in my backyard, uh, well, my watershed anyway. So this is the Plaster Creek of Grand Rapids. Here's the Grand River for which uh, the city of Grand Rapids is named. Uh, the Grand River comes up and wraps around. And there's this little creek here. You see the creek going along? That's called Plaster Creek. And the red dots are all of the Christian Reformed churches of my denomination in that watershed including the denominational headquarters and Calvin College owned by the denomination. And so some of the biologists at Calvin realized, you know, let's work on cleaning up our part of God's creation. And they got people out there in the hip boots and collecting the, um, the trash out of the, the stream. They're working with the people living in rural areas here on the fertilizer used in their fields. They're working with people with parking lots and, and runoff from those. They're planting rain gardens. It's not going to change the climate, but it is going to be, it is part of caring for our world. And so there are practical things you can do in your own communities. Science also helps in engaging the public square. Um, I already, did I mention bioethics? Um, the, at the rate that medical care is changing, the advancing uh, imaging capabilities, uh, surgery techniques, implants, um, things you can do to at, at the beginning of life and at the end of life. It's in all of the genetics testing. There are huge issues in bioethics and they are changing rapidly. And uh, I would hope that some young people will 
uh, dig into that question and be part of the church's voice there. Science is also helpful in the uh, evangelism. So many of the uh, new atheist arguments are some of the, the very vocal atheists and anti-theists, they even call themselves, um, they often will use science. They'll say, oh, science has disproved God. Science has shown that religion is just superstition. And we, science needs to counter that. We need to, you need to have an understanding of science in order to counter it effectively. We want to show warrant for belief. I do not believe that science can prove the existence of God, but I think there's certainly, it's, it's in harmony with the God of the Bible, with what we're learning from science, and it can uh, support belief in God. So making that case is important. This is a picture of Natasha. She was a graduate student in uh, biochemistry, and she grew up but not without a strong faith. And, uh, but in graduate school, she had some difficult life experiences. She didn't share what they were. But uh, she told us that you know, through the, the work of some friends and family, she came to commit her life to Jesus Christ. But then she wondered, how in the world do I fit that with my research in uh, biochemistry. How do I make that work? And that's when she found our website and some of the authors associated with BioLogos, and she wrote to us, it changed my life. It allowed her to see how she could keep her mind engaged as a Christian, how she could fit her scientific career that she loved with her newfound faith, and I'm happy to say that her faith is thriving, as is her career. She's off now doing a postdoc. Uh, Stephen Blake is a layperson. He works in the film industry. But for him, too, he's um, not a scientist, but he's somebody who uh, loves science. He likes reading about it and learning about it. And he, too, could not see how his, he became a Christian as an adult. And, um, and he became a Christian through the work of a, a very strongly young earth church. And I, I, I have personally learned a lot of things in my own walk of faith from young earth creationists. So this is, it's not, I, I'm, I'm serious when I say that we're uh, I'm Christians together. And he stayed in that church a long time. But he needed to figure out a way to fit it with his, um, the, the science that he would read elsewhere in the New York Times. And he found it helpful on our website to see how to put that together. Um, I'm going to read this quote from Augustine because it um, seems so apt, even though it's from 300 some uh, AD. Usually, even a non Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens, the other elements of this world, about the motion and orbit of the stars, about the uh, predictable eclipses of the sun and the moon. This is all known in 300 some AD about the kinds of animals, shrubs, stones, and so forth. And this knowledge he, this non-Christian holds to as being certain from reason and experience. Now, it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an infidel, a non-Christian, um, to hear a Christian, presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics. <laughs> and uh, Augustine said, I didn't say it, Augustine said, and uh, we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh it to scorn. The shame is not so much that an ignorant individual is derided, but that people outside the household of faith think our sacred writers held such opinions. And to the great loss of those for whose salvation we toil, the writers of our scripture are criticized and rejected as unlearned men. If they, if they, they the non-Christians, find a Christian mistaken in a field which they themselves know well, and hear him maintaining his foolish opinions about our books, how are they going to believe those books in matters concerning the resurrection of the dead, the hope of eternal life, and the kingdom of heaven, when they think their pages are full of falsehoods and on facts which they themselves have learned from experience in the light of reason? Okay, not, not much more I need to add. That, that's the issue that we face and why science is important to the work of the church. What? Woohoo, Augustine, yes. All right, so uh, that much about issues. There's uh, engaging science, though, in the church, I believe, should not be fundamentally about issues um, and about controversy. People develop this negative idea that science is always there to challenge their faith. And as a scientist myself, oh, that just breaks my heart because for me, studying science just enriches my faith and enriches my walk with God and my worship. So, and if you look in the Bible, when it refers to the natural world, it's telling us things about God and his creation, and it's calling us to worship uh, the creator. John Calvin wrote about the sense of the divine, the sensus divinitatis of um, seeing God when we look at the natural world and learning something about his character. 
that comes through in a confession of my uh, own tradition of the, um, in the Reformed Church, uh, where the Belgian Confession talks about the means we w by which we know God, first by the preservation, uh, creation, preservation, and government of the universe. Okay, as an astronomer, I love that that's first. <laughs> okay. um, so that universe is before our eyes like a beautiful book. Second, God makes himself known to us more openly by his holy and divine word as much as we need in this life. So studying, uh, the considering science, it's a window into God's creation. So I'd like to say a few thoughts about preaching. I am not a preacher, and many of you are, so this is with a bit of trepidation. Um, I have, this is mostly stuff I have heard from people who preach. Uh, and so hopefully there's something here that it might be useful. Um, so pitfall to avoid is making the sermon into a science lesson. Um, Scott Jose, the, the leader of that ministry theorem project, he always talked about how whenever you're, you might be talking about science, but the focus always has to be uh, God's written word and re revealing that, what the scripture is saying. Um, so some creative ideas for doing it. Uh, so I heard one pastor give a sermon on John 15, the vine and the branches. Now, most people today aren't familiar with vines and branches. You know, some gardeners are. Um, but an entirely new modern uh, example, looking at neural networks in the brain and the way nerves uh, die off if they're not used. Um, it was just a, a beautiful, fresh way of looking at that important passage in John 15. Um, uh, illustrations, my own pastor, when he was preaching on the Holy Spirit as, as breath, uh, the breath of life, describing what happens in lungs when we breathe air and how that's important in our bodies. Um, using it in, the, in an application, uh, when we're talking about ministering to the poor, talking about you know, some of these uh, appropriate technologies or, or assisting in, in concrete ways. Challenging students to have a career where they're using their skills in engineering or medicine to be uh, part of ministry. Now, what about that issue of the scientific errors, saying some wrong science from the pulpit? Well, uh, so I have sat in congregations when that's happened, okay? And when the pastor is there trying to explain some correct science and just gets a little bit wrong, I'm like, that's fine. You know, it doesn't really even bother me that much. If the pastor is trying to explain something that's contrary to mainstream science, oh my. Um, then, you know, then I'm like, ah, this is, this is wrong. And, um, it's, it's very uh, uh, detrimental to everybody in the congregation who has a scientific mindset. So, um, so you do want to be careful. You can read up yourself. Some uh, pastors really get into this. They love reading about science and, and bringing it into their uh, sermon. But you don't have to try to explain it all yourself. You can bring in a scientist. Maybe there's a scientist in your congregation. Um, maybe you can uh, interview somebody, or maybe you can just show a video. So much is available on YouTube now, you can just show something. So you don't have to explain the science yourself. What we need pastors for is to explain all the questions that I get. As a scientist, I'm asked to explain how to interpret Genesis 1. Like, okay, come on, I, you know, we want the pastor to come alongside and explain that. Um, or explaining some of the theological issues. So you can play to your strengths and be general about the science. And something Scott Jose said is, um, I, some of this is more caught than taught. So even if you're not, re you don't need to be referring to science in every sermon, that would be silly. There's way too much to preach on. But you, you can be the type of person who enjoys science, who mentions occasionally, hey, I read this cool thing in the New York Times science section, or I saw this you know, neat thing on uh, PBS about string theory in the universe. And just you know, a few things like that show people in the congregation that science is worth engaging and is, is not something to fear and something that can tell us about the glory of God. I have a couple of ideas here of things you can do besides Sunday morning. I think most of these are in your handout. Um, it, uh, when you're outdoors with your congregation, maybe it's a church picnic or something, you can go on a nature walk and you can end with a song of praise. You can connect that into the uh, broader world as your church goes out. I want to allow time for questions, so I'm going to uh, skip here to uh, my last main point, which is worship informed by science. So Psalm 19.1 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. I believe that nature is also proclaiming a lot of attributes of God. God's beauty and power and creativity and faithfulness and intelligence and immensity and intricacy and extravagance. And if you come back from my talks later today, you'll see examples of some of these attributes of God where I see them displayed in his creation. 
So I, I, I don't want to fall into the error of natural theology here of uh, the idea that you can learn everything you want to know about God just by looking at the natural world. But I, what I think, we, we go to scripture to learn about God. That's a, that special revelation from God is our primary source for knowing about his character, his uh, intention for our lives, and um, all, all of the most important things in our walk with God. But looking at the natural world can show you the extent of some of these things. It can enliven the imagination. It can stretch your mind. Um, what we have in, in God's word is the printed page, and it's not always easy to, um, from that to, to get an idea of the larger world. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. A pitfall to avoid here is the God of the gaps. Uh, you may never have heard that term. So the God of the gaps is uh, the God people refer to for the God who explains the things that science can't explain. So say all of science, you know, here's the extent of the world, all the stuff there, and science can explain a bunch of it, right? But then there's this part over here that science can't explain. And so people have said, ah, God did it. God does that part. Well then, what happens when science expands and it starts to explain more and more stuff? Then this part here where God, we said God was doing it, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you have God as this God of just this tiny gap in our scientific knowledge. And if that is the primary place you're seeing God, your God is about to disappear. So the answer to that is to see God in all the stuff science can explain. So a scientific explanation doesn't drive out God, it doesn't replace God. Instead, it reveals God's handiwork. It shows us how God is actually um, creating and going about his work. To me, it enhances faith. So it's particularly tempting in worship. I see a lot of people saying things, oh, that's such and such, it was just so amazing. It was a miracle. Science, you know, those scientists, they'd never be able to understand this thing. That's where God is. And they want to praise God for that, um, that, that bit where the scientists have uh, failed. And, huh. I mean, it, it seems to, to push God into this little gap, and, and God is, is so much bigger than that. Here's a, a congregational prayer written by a medical doctor in my church who loves science, and this is the prayer that he said. Creator God, out of nothing you created all that is. You hurled the galaxies through time and space. You formed all of the suns from gas and the countless planets from dust. Your creation is boundless. Creator God, the universe is your hourglass, the continental drift your minute hand, and the Grand Canyon your second hand. You are infinite. Creator God, out of nothing you created life. The oceans teem with creatures from plankton to whales. The earth is covered with plants from moss to redwoods. Amoebas to elephants inhabit the earth. You are limitless. Creator God, who are we that you would notice us? Who are we that you would consider us? To you we are dust in the wind. To you we are dew on a summer morning. Father God, you created us. You formed us from dust and water. You blew your spirit into us, making us in your image. Savior God, you became our Emmanuel, humbling yourself to become God with us. You lived with us, showing us how to live and love. You hung on the cross, dying that we might live. Every scientific thing in there is completely accurate. But it doesn't sound like a science lesson, did it? And I, I just thought it was beautifully done. So maybe that will inspire you. So there are two um, very different meanings of the word chance or random that are floating around in our culture. Chance uh, being scientific randomness is one definition. I put that with a lowercase c. That is scientific unpredictability, OK? It's when. Um, uh, Scientists, un, un, you know, they understand the whole system, and they, some events cannot be exactly predicted, but they can give them a probability. It's usually a, a part of a well-structured system, but there's some parts that are unpredictable. Chance with a capital C is used in our colloquial language to mean lack of purpose, or sometimes it's associated with sort of a god of chaos kind of thing. It the, indicates the absence of meaning or intent. And, and people say, oh, that's replay, you know, it's, it's setting it up in opposition to the god of the Bible. So when somebody says, life is too amazing to have come about by chance, it, if you hear that as a scientific statement, well, it, what they're really talking about, though, is they mean life is too amazing to have come about without God. That's really what people are saying. 
So conflating these leads to all sorts of problems. If you're putting that scientific predictability and saying that whenever there's scientific unpredictability, that means there's purposeless and meaning, meaninglessness, that is, is uh, mixing these things inappropriately. Humans use, per, use randomness in purposeful ways. You can be intentional about your randomness. We do it every time we toss a coin. We value the randomness in that, is we use it as a way to make um, you know, decisions between equal parties. In a video game, game designers put in randomness because that makes the game more creative, more interesting. They're using it intentionally. Doesn't mean the game is chaotic, but it does, that unpredictability is part of the intent of the game designer. There's even random art. Um, there's an artist who, ha you can go to randomart.org, and has uh, made an algorithm that has some uh, random factors in it and that has, produces this beautiful artwork. So randomness can be beautiful. God can be at work in randomness. It's not an either or question. God can create a system in which scientific randomness plays a role and the overall desired outcome is achieved. And in fact, the desired outcome might be something that's unpredictable. God can select the outcome of particular events. So in Proverbs it says the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So God can be you know, at work in those random events. Here's how I, uh, my favorite recent example my husband and I came up with. Was it this winter with all the snow? I think maybe. Um, we were thinking about snowflakes and how they're this incredible mixture of regularity and randomness. So there's the regularity of the laws of physics, of the phase transition between water and ice, of the crystalline structure, the six-sided crystal, incredibly regular. And yet, there's also the randomness of how that crystal is dancing through the air and gradually growing and having a different shape. And so we love both of those things about snowflakes. People love the regular um, structured appearance and also the fact that every single one is unique. If they're all identical, it would look like it came out of a factory. And instead, it looks like God's creation. So God is using randomness in a purposeful way. All right, I will end there so we can have some time for questions. The history of how science and religion have been related is um, uh, fascinating, especially that the, most of the early scientists in Western Europe in the 1600s, 1700s, um, uh, Kepler and Galileo and Boyle and then Faraday in the next century and, and many others, um, were devout Christians and saw their scientific work as a natural outgrowth of their faith. So I'll say a little more on that later. Um, yes, learning what evolution actually is is um, huge because people just hear, oh, bad word, evolution's atheism, so I'm gonna disagree with that. And um, so breaking it down. And in fact, there was a survey. Um, one of the grants Biologos gave was to a sociologist named Jonathan Hill, uh, who did a survey where he tried to break down you know, I, I gave that 45% number there for people who say young earth, and he broke it down in, into like three separate statements. You know, do you believe God created? Do you believe it was 10,000 years ago? Do you believe, you know, kind of just pieced it out and had people say whether they agreed or not with each piece, and also how sure they were, and how important it was to them to have the right answer. And if you count then the ones who agreed with all of those statements and were sure of it and thought it was very important to have the right answer, it dropped to like 8% of US adults, dropped way down. So there are, for a lot of people, they're un, unsure about it and could, um, might be open to education because they, they're um, at, you know, willing to ask questions. So. Okay, when do you start to have some view on science that's taking you out of the Apostles' Creed and into something else? Okay. So people you know, will draw their lines differently. So the answers in Genesis crowd, they, will, they call us at Biologos uh, compromised Christians. And they, they say it's not essential to the faith, but we're somehow we're not really Christians. Uh, at Biologos, we would put the line at the Apostles' Creed, you know, of, of uh, believing in Jesus Christ as the, and the Trinity, and I mean, okay, I guess Nicene Creed, um, uh, believing in God as the creator of believing in the authority and inspiration of the Bible. Uh, but you can go beyond that to people who would still consider themselves Christian. I, I don't know, I mean, this is more of a theological question than a scientific one, really. Um, I, I do have a fascinating survey on that I can show you, though. Um, let's see, bring this up. So this is another survey that came out in February. Um, if you want to Google it, uh, look for Elaine Eklund, AAAS, or uh, Rice University. And uh, she broke down not just like two, two or three positions, but six different positions 
And she broke down many different faith traditions here. So we've got evangelical Protestant, mainline Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic. And so up here in this corner you have evangelical Protestants, 43% of them are saying that creationism, young earth creationism is definitely true. Drops a lot from mainline Protestant, um, 18%. Um, that, I don't know if that's more or less than you expected based on your own experiences. 3% uh, atheist and agnostic saying creationism, which the uncertainty in the survey is around 3%, and that's kind of what you're seeing there is just like, I don't know, people weren't listening or something. Um, <laughs> Similarly, down here, what you have is atheistic evolution, evolution without God, and you got 3% of evangelical Protestants saying that, so that doesn't make sense. One of the things that really struck me, though, is if you add up the totals of these, of who will say it's, they're definitely true about any of the views, evangelical Protestants, 95% of them are definitely true of something. It's very important in the evangelical world to be definitely true and sure of your faith and not doubt. Mainline Protestant, 58%. Jew, 41%. Jews love to question. Their whole tradition is about questioning and dialogue, and you can totally see that in this survey. So those are some of the differences. Uh, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, 10% uh, in the Young Earth creationism. That's actually growing, especially in the Muslim world. There's a whole Young Earth creation movement in the Muslim world. Uh, but more of them going along with the natural evolution of, of God not being involved. And then these are all the intermediate positions, intelligent design, evolutionary creation, and stuff. Um, uh, first on the theory thing, oh my goodness, this is such a, a pet peeve of people in the scientific world because we use the word theory to talk about the really big ideas of science, the ones that we are quite sure of actually, that are very well supported, that are um, generating new research. And so it's used in a very different sense than in, um, uh, in our everyday lives. We're like, oh, you just got a theory about that. Uh, so, so, so there are definitely language issues. It's kind of like about the, that two meanings of the word chance. Uh, how do we deal with this issue of wanting to be sure? From, I, I personally struggled with this because I grew up in this evangelical tradition. You've got to be sure. And for me, it helped to break it down into like there's the core things that I am sure of and I'm not going to wishy-wash about, but they, they are, I believe, the absolute truths about the universe. And then there's all these secondary issues where I don't need to be sure, where I can disagree with other believers, where um, I can continue exploring and thinking about, and, and having those different levels really help me. And that's some, a lot of the language we're using. We don't want to fall into a simply relativist, oh, you believe what you want, I believe what I want, we can all just believe whatever. Uh, that's not the, uh, the faith that I want to have. But we can't stand on every hill and say, this is sure, this is sure, this is sure. There's, so having two tiers uh, really helped me on that. Jewish physicist, Gerald Schroeder, um, so he's been doing writing on science and faith, and I've uh, read one of his books and tried to work out the equations he, he was talking about. He has an idea that you can use general relativity and other ideas from relativity to um, sort of line up natural history with the six days in, in Genesis and it, that it kind of works. And uh, when I looked at the math and the references he was using, I didn't think it worked. So I, I, I had some issues with his science, honestly. But not with his whole project, you know, of looking for the harmony between um, the, the, the scriptures and nature, that's great, but the particulars weren't working.